Ah, I think Liz, I don't think you've got your mic on. Can you hear me now okay? Perfect. Excellent. So uh, I'm Liz Gillis. I'm a professor at the university here on Vancouver Island where the marmots live. I actually don't do any research on Vancouver Island marmots, but my background is research on um, ground dwelling squirrels similar to marmots. And so when I came here, I was asked to this university, I was asked uh, if I would like to sit on the marmot recovery team. Uh, to provide kind of an external scientific perspective on some of the recovery plants and uh, management of the species. So I've been doing that for about 12 years. I was fortunate enough to be able to attend the uh, population and habitat viability analysis workshop that was done on this species. And so um, I'm here both uh, talking a bit about what we've learned from my perspective. And I think it's important to realize that I think everyone on the recovery team took something different away from this workshop. So I'm not speaking for the whole recovery team, but I can certainly provide my perspective on uh, what worked and wh why things worked the way they did. Adam? So my name's Adam Taylor. I'm the executive director of the Marmot Recovery Foundation. Uh, I did not attend the workshop. I didn't join the foundation until several months after the workshop was completed. So I was essentially handed um, the results of the workshop and, and then told to go forth and, and implement them. So my perspective is a little bit different than, than Liz's. Uh, the Marmot Recovery Foundation is a not-for-profit, a charity that's charged with delivering the on-the-ground effort to actually recover the marmot. So we release captive bred Vancouver Island marmots to the wild. We do all the monitoring of the wild population. We have a captive breeding center um, in one of the colonies at a spot called Mount Washington. And, um, and we do some habitat restoration work as well for our colonies that are being impacted by tree ingress. So we're very much uh, focused on that, that on the ground and delivery side, uh, but we're just one of a group of partners. Liz has mentioned one of the important partners, which is the recovery team. The recovery team is a group of uh, biologists and stakeholders uh, people who provide strategic guidance, and that's assembled by the provincial and federal government. We also work with our provincial government, with private landowners, and we have two other captive breeding centers at the Calgary Zoo and the Toronto Zoo that uh, actually care for captive marmots and provide the pups that we then release to the wild. Liz, did you want to we talked about who we are. Um, yeah. If you want to provide a little bit of the background on, on the species that we actually work with and the place where we're working. Sure, that sounds great, Adam. Um, so we've already provided an introduction to ourselves, so I think we can move to the next slide. So uh, just before we get into the planning workshop that was held and, and lessons learned, um, a bit about the species we're talking about. The Vancouver Island marmot is is a very large squirrel. Um, it is a ground dwelling squirrel that hibernates men, much of the year. They are endemic to Vancouver Island, um, which is a fair size island off the west coast of Canada. In the 1990s, severe population decline. Um, and the reasons for this, well, as with many endangered species, after the fact, it's hard to pinpoint exactly. But it's felt that what happened is was that logging activities at higher elevation created some cut, cut block areas that provided initially excellent marmot habitat. And then marmots, uh, many marmots moved into those cut blocks. It simulated their natural subalpine habitat. And for um, a few years, it provided excellent habitat. However, as succession occurred, it became desirable habitat for one of our native ungulates, um, really good vegetation for elk, which then moved from lower elevation to take advantage of this successional stage, which of course brought along the elk predators. And so it's thought that it was this large um, scale habitat change changed where predators, other predators and prey were on the landscape that led to declines not only in the cut blocks, but because these cut blocks were now close to subalpine habitat, um, the predators that came up to the cut blocks would also hunt marmots in the subalpine. 
regardless of the cause of the decline, um, by uh, the late 90s, there were only about 100 individuals of this species left in the wild. It became Canada's most critically endangered species. And so captive breeding program was begun in 2004. Just, just to clarify quickly, the captive breeding program started in 1997, but we released our very first marmots from the captive breeding program in 2004. And we've released marmots from the captive breeding program every year since then. Thanks, Adam. Um, so this is a current distribution of where marmots are. Um, at the time of the decline, there were still two, we'll call them groups, there's two meta populations of the species that are geographically separated about 75 kilometers um, apart. The northernmost group though only had marmots persisting on one colony at one site um, on Mount Washington, which is a ski hill. In the southern area, what we refer to as the Nanaimo Lakes metapopulation, there were a few colonies that persisted all at really small numbers. So um, since then, and with uh, thanks to the recovery efforts and captive breeding, many of those colonies have been reestablished, um, but at the time of the population low, uh, it was a very dire situation. So just to put it in context, uh, in 2004, just before we released our first captive bred marmots, uh, there were th fewer than 30 marmots left in the wild. Um, today, the, the population is certainly improved. We are looking at about 200 individuals in the wild, uh, but they're, they're still a long way from a recovered species. Okay, and now we'll go into kind of coming into the workshop, um, which is uh, my understanding is one of the the interests of this group. So, um, as with many endangered species, as recovery occurs, the question becomes: Has it recovered enough? Can we step away? And so, as recovery um, efforts were initially um, successful to varying extents, numbers of marmots in the wild went up. And by t about 2011, uh, a lot of the stakeholders were confident that the Nanaimo Lakes population had recovered. Numbers had met or were close to what had been identified as uh, the recovery goal. But of course, those involved in the recovery know how variable year to year numbers can change. And so um, there was some skepticism among the recovery team whether or not the species was point we could step away. That being said, uh, with limited funds, um, there was pressure to reduce uh, the captive breeding program and so the captive breeding program was wound down and a large number of marmots were released at that point to downside the captive population. Initially, after those reintroductions had stopped to that more southern area, the population actually did do really well. Numbers continued to rise. Uh, reproduction was good. Survival was, was reasonably good. Um, and so there was initially, uh, it looked like things were going well. Unfortunately, about 2014, the, the population in that southern area once again started to go down. Um, fairly quickly initially and has continued. So after what appeared to be an initial success, there was um, questions about whether the species could even be recovered. And so one of the things coming into the workshop was the desire to show quantitatively um, and evaluate whether or not recovery was a, a possibility with this species. Now, the idea of a workshop like the PHVA, the Population Habitat and Viability Analysis Workshop that was held, um, had been proposed by Dr. Um, Axel, I don't know, sorry Axel if you're on the line, uh, Dr. Yeah. Axel Morgan Rutschler, um, prior to this one actually being held uh, two to three years before the the workshop that was held was held and initially the there was some 
questions about how useful such a workshop would be. At that point, um, there had been some past experiences where workshops had been held that had not produced results that had been helpful to the on-the-ground conservation practitioners. And it was, it was wondered whether this was the best use of time. In addition, at that point, there had not been a relationship between the on-the-ground um, recovery practitioners and that particular group and Axel in that way. And so that relationship hadn't been established yet. That being said, Axel, um, a couple of years later, once again proposed this workshop. And at that point, the recovery team and the recovery practitioners were realizing that there were some questions that could only be answered by the sort of workshop that was being proposed and that the individuals involved didn't necessarily have the expertise internally. We didn't have what we needed to do, the type of modeling um, and answer the questions that we had. And so the decision was to made for to uh, made to go forward and to try to uh, to hold this workshop. So thanks to Axel for his persistence. So um, I would argue that the the workshop was incredibly successful. And looking back, I've tried to identify what I thought were some of the key elements that made this workshop quite successful. The first was that over between the initial workshop being proposed and the second uh, invitation to participate in a workshop like this, relationships were starting to build. Um, and the relationships were between the IUCN CBSG group, the recovery team, and the, the recovery foundation. And those relationships continued to be built, particularly moving up to the workshop as data was needed to be pulled together. Um, throughout the relationship building and immediately before the uh, workshop as we started to pull data together, it became more and more clear that this workshop really would be driven by the needs of the recovery team and the Marmot Recovery Foundation that the purpose of this workshop through the IUCN and the other um, individuals involved was to help bring in experts to facilitate, to help bring in experts to run the, the actual modeling exercises, but that the questions and the needs were going to be driven by what the recovery team and the recovery foundation had identified as, as questions that they really wanted to explore. The workshop brought together not only those experts that could do the workshop, but it did bring in external um, academics and external conservation practitioners. Um, and that allowed it to provide new perspectives. Those individuals, along with the IUCN uh, CBSG involvement, I think really increased it, the credibility of the workshop as well as the resulting report and Adam's going to speak to that a bit later as well as the importance of having external oversight to provide credibility when speaking to um, external individuals. And finally the way the workshop itself during the workshop was structured really allowed um, both formal time and then during breaks for some really good discussions between those involved in the field-based recovery, the captive breeding group, the Marmot Recovery Foundation, and that led to a much better appreciation of the challenges felt and challenges faced by each group. So as someone on the recovery team, although I thought I understood some of the challenges associated with captive breeding, um, and and things like uh, stopping breeding and reducing breeding and the th things like that until I got a chance to sit down and have conversations with those individuals involved with captive breeding I didn't fully appreciate some of the challenges so that really increased my awareness and finally um, well just before we take a quick break in case there's some questions um, 
coming out of the workshop, there were a few major recommendations. They fell into three really broad categories. The first was a series of recommendations about administration. So things about how to effectively secure funding, how to communicate um, about recommendations and the recovery efforts. The second uh, group of recommendations all dealt with the science and data organization needed to more effectively monitor and track um, the recovery of this species. And then there was another group that dealt with which recovery and prioritized which recovery actions were actually needed. So um, in particular, it was identified that increasing releases to the wild um, or reducing predation basically had to happen for continued recovery of this species. So I think um, at this point, Jamie, Adam, and I had indicated we could take a couple of questions if people had questions about the lead up to the workshop. Thank you. Workshop. Yeah, thank you, Liz. Um, has anybody um, got a, uh, a question? We'll try actually this one with the, with the mics and see how that goes. Um, is there somebody? Uh, I, I, maybe this is disastrous in terms of keeping track of it. Um, Alan, I've got you down as um, um, Alan and then Katty. Um, Alan, uh, um, Alan, did you have a question you wanted to ask? I, I'm presuming I'm presuming not there. Um, Katty, did you have one you wanted to ask? Oh no, I hadn't indicated a question. You, you, no, not not Kathy. Is it? Is this Kathy? Yeah. Okay, you sound just like Kathy, who um, <laughs> went with the CBSG. Um, well, I, I, no, I. This is Kathy at CBSG. I don't know it? who you were asking. Oh, yeah. yeah no. So it's Kathy. Kathy Jerik Zipfel. Um, mm -hmm. Did you have a question you want to ask? Okay, there's somebody in the chat room just here. So James with the, um, is saying, with respect to the threats, was the augmentation predation the only threat to the animals? Were human actions directly threatening the marmots as well, aside from logging? Uh, great question. We believe that it was mainly um, via the logging. The subalpine area, uh, is not under a lot of pressure from human development uh, on Vancouver Island. It's Vancouver Island's fairly remote and rugged in a lot of the areas where the marmots live. So it's felt that it was mainly landscape level changes. Sorry, could somebody, could, could others, if you've got your mics on but not wanting to ask a question, could you just turn them off and then that would just help clarity. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so just to, to finish off, the, the main threats, um, now that being said, whether or not it was solely the landscape level changes that increased predation rates, um, we do know that predators on Vancouver Island undergo fluctuations in their population size. The other major thing uh, on, an, on a much larger time scale affecting the marmots is habitat change post-glaciation and in general as we see the loss of the higher elevation habitats occurring. Um, that's just uh, uh, has been going on since the last glaciation, which are in this area was uh, was about ten thousand years ago. Adam, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I was just going to say the marmots are perhaps a little bit unusual in the sense that their core habitat, those subalpine meadows that uh, they reside in for most of their lives, are still in reasonably good condition. As Liz alluded to, they're they're under threat due to climate change and tree ingress. But what really seemed to threaten the marmot were landscape changes that occurred between those colonies. So uh, certainly the influx of roads, uh, logging activity, uh, the creation of dams, and, and that had a number of results. The big one was that marmots at about two years of age start to disperse from their natal colony. And when they were doing that, instead of ending up in another marmot colony somewhere else, they were often being uh, attracted essentially to these artificial marmot meadows in these cut blocks. 
And then they would set up colonies there. They would thrive for a little while. But as soon as trees started to regrow, those colonies would be wiped out very quickly. Liz alluded to the other uh, factors in those colonies, actually pulling ungulates up out of lower elevation areas into those high elevation areas. And we believe that predators follow those ungulates. Marmots have never been a primary prey species. It's always been a somewhat opportunistic animal. So, so putting cougars and wolves into more contact with marmots, uh, we believe increased the level of predation on marmots. Though we don't have any direct evidence of that. I think as with many species that are remote and they're not economically important, um, there wasn't a lot of information collected about marmots. So we don't have baseline data on what the rate of predation was in the 1970s or earlier. But, uh, but we, we strongly suspect that predation rates increased as marmots came into more and more frequent contact with predators. So um, did that answer the, the question? Yeah, I I'm think so. And so um, Adam probably will want to get moving to your next section so we can get through the how the results of the workshop have been used uh, post-workshop. So over to Adam. All right, so, so that was really my job, was to try and take this and, and with our staff start to implement some of the recommendations. Uh, certainly a large number of the recommendations came on the data side. We've been collecting data for almost 20 years on marmots, uh, but it was literally stored in you know random Excel spreadsheets here and there on various computers, uh, sometimes in paper files. So one of the big recommendations and one of the things that we were able to undertake was to try and collect as much of that data as possible, um, put it into a database so that we could extract that information more easily. And that's been completed now. Um, although as with any database, there, uh, it's, it's not perfect and there's still lots of smaller issues that we're trying to sort through. But, but it's certainly a, a great improvement over the status quo that we had prior to that. The other big recommendation was that we really needed to revitalize the captive breeding program, that we needed to be releasing more marmots to the wild than we were. So at the time when the workshop was done, we were down to releasing about 12 marmots a year on average to the wild. And uh, the recommendation was just to support one of our two meta populations. We need to be releasing 25 marmots a year. So probably needed to get back to the point where we were releasing 50 or more marmots per year. So to do that, we needed to reopen one of our captive breeding centers that have been shuttered and increase the size of the captive population. And this has been a, a, a challenge, a communications challenge for us because marmots are slow breeders. And to take marmots out of the wild into the captive population without jeopardizing the fragile wild population that it, that remains, we wanted to target individuals that had a really low likelihood of survival. So that meant either marmots that we were finding in inappropriate habitats. So we get these marmots that would disperse from their natal colony at two years of age, and some of them go left when they should have gone right, and they end up just somewhere wildly inappropriate. We had uh, this mountain species, we had one that ended up on a beach on the west coast. Um, we had one that ended up in a, somebody's woodshed last year. So those marmots, they have a very low likelihood of survival. So they were really good candidates for adding to the, to the captive program. And then the remainder are pups. You don't want to take too many pups, but the reality is that survival rates for pups in the wild are fairly low. Uh, so again, they make good candidates for adding to the captive program as long as you're leaving, um, you know, pulling one or two pups out of large litters, for instance, um, and not, uh, not really critically injuring the pups that are remaining in the wild or the numbers of pups that are there. But none of those marmots are going to breed quickly. Marmots take about three years to reach breeding age. Once they've reached breeding age at three or four years old, they only produce pups once every other year. So it's, um, it's an ongoing process. The very first marmots that we brought into captivity in 2016, a couple of them have bred. Um, but the majority of the work of revitalizing, or the majority of the results from revitalizing the captive population, we still are probably another year to two years away from 
seen a substantial increase in the number of marmots that we can release to the wild. And of course, we've got uh, ANSI stakeholders. They, they'd like to see this species recovered because we're asking them to pony up the dollars while, uh, while we do the work. So they really would like to see more results more quickly, but we're not aware of any way to increase the speed at which these marmots breed. Liz, did you want to talk about uh, some of the other ways you've used the, the workshop results? I'll turn on my mic. Yeah, so thanks, Adam. Specifically, the timing of the workshop and one of the reasons that uh, the recovery team had identified it was really important to participate in a workshop like this is we were coming up to a, a point at which a couple of key documentations documents needed to be written. And so um, one of those was the provincial, which then also becomes the federal recovery plan for the species. And so um, a lot of the data that was used, as well as the results of the workshop, uh, the actual results of the modeling exercise, were used to really um, help write that document. In addition, participation in the workshop really influenced and, and modified the recovery team's thoughts and approach and language to, to how they thought about recovery and what constitutes recovery. And so the, those all manifested and kind of integrated and became part of the provincial and federal recovery plans. In addition, um, the other document was uh, in Canada. We have the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, COSIWIC. They are the organization that evaluates species and based on their biology and quantitative criteria that they have, they establish whether a species is endangered or, or um, threatened. And an update to that status report was uh, needed. It's currently in the final drafting stages of that. So once again, one of the criteria they look at is uh, population viability analysis results. So the workshop results were able to go directly into that. In addition, a lot of the data analysis protocols, how survival was calculated, how population size was calculated, the methods for that that were established for the workshop continued to carry on post-workshop, which once again allowed some really strong data to be incorporated into all of those documents. All right, Adam. So I alluded to some of the challenges that we've had um, implementing the results of the workshop. Uh, data analysis continues to be a challenge. Um, we've collected the data, it's, it's in a much better format, but obviously there's still a lot of issues in terms of collecting the knowledge, uh, the time and expertise to actually evaluate all of it properly. Uh, there's also a significant challenge in terms of implementing the actions and actually seeing the results of those actions, and that can stress the, the patience level of some of our stakeholders. Uh, and I didn't capture it here in my notes, but there is a communications challenge. I think one of the most important outcomes of this workshop was moving away from the language of hard numbers. We'd really set targets in the past that looked at saying things like we need 200 marmots in this spot and when we achieve 200 marmots you know recovery should be done and that wasn't feasible because not all marmots are the same an eight-year-old marmot on the landscape is unlikely to be breeding and contributing to the future of the population uh, a newborn pup likewise its survival uh, likelihood is pretty low um, really the marmots that you're concerned about are those sort of middle-aged prime breeding age marmots and it's more about population dynamics than it is about numbers. And, and the PVHA did a wonderful job of capturing that. Well, our challenge and my challenge has been finding ways to communicate that to stakeholders and to the public in a way that's meaningful to them. It, I think it sounds, uh, I'm still working on it. it. It sounds a little too technical, I think, for many people. And it sounds like I'm ducking the question when they say, well, how many marmots do you need? 
And I say, well, it's not about the number of marmots, it's more about how likely they are to be able to survive in the wild. Uh, so that's been a challenge as well. And one of the things that has really come out of the workshop and maybe wasn't anticipated in the workshop itself, that, that both Liz and I have discussed a little is that it has been a really important tool for us to communicate with stakeholders. The, the plan has a certain amount of authority because of the way that it was constructed, because it had uh, external experts uh, that participated in it. That has become a really important communications tool. And, and it has continued to be a really important part of the way that we work with um, our provincial governments and our private landowners. Uh, so that's, whether that was intended or not, it has certainly been a real boon from, from the workshop. I think we we set aside a little space here if there were some additional questions that people wanted to ask before uh, we move on to uh, the lessons that we learned. Thank you, Adam. These are they're slightly out of sync because they came in just after your your last um, piece. But um, Mike was just asking whether or not um, <laughs> whether or not you observe changes in disease or parasite pressure ca caused by habitat change. Okay, so um, I'll take this one, Adam, at least briefly. So one of the difficulties we have is that the amount of baseline data um, at the time was, was very low. So in terms of disease and parasite pressure, certainly that was explored when people were trying to find out the cause of the decline, um, but there was no sort of pre-data. Um, and so uh, Malcolm McKady, who is the veterinarian with the Marmot Recovery Foundation, could provide specific details. But, uh, and Adam, jump in if I'm incorrect. But my understanding is that they weren't observed to have changed. However, it's, that does not mean that uh, th there's an absence of some data, of pre data. One of the things that um, is ant had antidotally been observed at the really low population signs is there was some um, indications, even though it's not there in the genetic signature, that there may have been some inbreeding occurring, uh, inbreeding depression occurring in that Mount Washington population, which was very isolated. And certainly once the captive breeding program began and there was some crossbreeding, they did see slight increases in the reproductive rates. Um, but once again, that wasn't at a level that could be picked up based on the genetics is my understanding. Adam, do you have anything to add to about the parasites and disease? No, um, I was just gonna mention Jasmine's work. So the question about parasites, it's a really good one. And, and as Liz said, we, we have a lack of baseline data from prior to the recovery program really starting. Um, one of Liz's colleagues is undertaking to do some uh, work with the marmots and, and part of that will hopefully identify what kind of parasite load some of the wild marmots have that we're not able to examine on a regular basis. Um, but uh, at the moment we don't believe that there's been a significant shift but certainly there's a lack of evidence to make any really strong statements there. Thanks for that guys and then one question from Peter which is something that I, I've been thinking a bit about uh, as well in relation to I suppose um, getting the best bang for your buck in planning for species. Um, Peter was asking whether or not the in the implementation of the recovery plan did you take into account the possible plans for other species in the same area? <laughs> That's a that's a really good question. Um, so, just uh, a bit of background in terms of requirements uh, for the provincial and federal governments, they require species recovery plans. So, certainly the provincial and federal recovery plans were focused on Vancouver Island marmots. Um, that's sort of one of the the recovery uh, requirements um, for species at risk here in Canada. That being said, um, when I think about other species that are in the area, in that subalpine area, 
there are not a lot of species that are restricted to that area and um, I can't think of any other species at risk in this particular habitat. How about you, Adam? There's there's a number of other species at risk that are occupy okay. the habitat at least on uh, at least occasionally. Um, so we've reported western toads, which are a, a species of special concern in Canada. Uh, we've uh, reported ermine or at least weasel, um, whose status is uh, on Vancouver Island, at least, is being questioned. Um, so they they occur, and there are cases in Canada where groups like the Seawick and the federal government have developed plans that include multiple species at risk. Um, so the Gary Oak ecosystems, for instance, uh, they examined a, a large number of species at risk that all lived in the same habitat. For marmots, it's true, we focus specifically on this species, and, and a big part of that is I think are a result of not having a lot of information about the habitats in which marmots live. These are not easy spots to access. Some of them are accessible on foot. Some of them are many of the habitats that we're headed into. Sorry, many of the habitats that we're headed into are only accessible by helicopter. Um, people haven't collected a lot of data. So I alluded to the least weasel data. Uh, or the interest in least weasel status on Vancouver Island. And the only places where we've been reporting least weasel on Vancouver Island are on the wildlife cameras that we've been setting up to capture images of marmots in our marmot meadows. So, um, so we just don't know, really. There hasn't been enough work done in these meadows to really assess whether or not the marmots are the only species at risk that regularly occupy the meadow or whether there's other species whose status simply hasn't been documented well enough yet. Uh, I suspect it's a combination of both. There is a, as we said before, the market for habitat, those subalpine meadows, they're not under a massive amount of direct pressure from human activity. They're treeless, so there's not a lot of forestry interest. They're at high elevation, they're difficult to access. Um, so my hope is that most of the species that occupy those spaces are in reasonable condition, but they're also fragmented and those species are suffering from the same uh, landscape changes that have occurred around these sort of high elevation pockets that, uh, that the marmots are. And, and so we'll, we'll see, as we gather more data, we'll see if other species emerge. But that was a really long way of saying, no, we really just looked at the marmot. Um, but uh, but I think I think it is worth acknowledging that there are uh, potential for other species in that area. We just we just don't have a really good handle on who they are um, and what their status is at this point in time. Yeah, and I do think I need to uh, point out too. I, I come from a very mammal centric view of the world, so uh, I I. I when I was initially responding, I didn't even think about all the potential endangered plant species up there. So um, just, just to let people be aware of my bias. Thank you, both of you. So Ed, I can't remember now whether more came after so you'd kind of, you'd had a, another split. I think there was, isn't there? Or is, there, is it back to open discussion? We do um, have there. a little bit more. Fantastic. Please go ahead. There's there are a couple other questions that are coming in, but we'll ask them at the end. Sure. So I think a lot of these sort of uh, these recommendations come from from me in the way that that we've ended up using this report that was perhaps not anticipated when the workshop itself was actually implemented. Uh, one of the things that I found in the report is the language that's used in the report isn't always really focused on the species. So it's something that I've been working with with our staff as well to, to really make sure that when we're talking about things that we want to do and how it's going to help the program, that we always keep ourselves focused on how that's going to impact this species at the end of the day. So for instance, um, one of the recommendations in the report uh, is that we utilize the data more fully. But it doesn't specify in that recommendation how that's really going to impact the marmots. So, the reason we want to utilize the data is because we want to make better decisions about where we're releasing marmots, about what recovery actions we're undertaking, about what 
uh, colonies have you know the most likelihood for recovery or need habitat improvement work and I think that that is obvious to those of us that spend a lot of time you know working with species at risk that spend a lot of time um, engaged particularly with a single species and a single species recovery effort and so we forget that one we're not the only people that are going to look at this report so because the report has authority uh, it's very likely to be shared with the other stakeholders governments uh, funders um, and and they're going to have a harder time making those connections they're not going to necessarily see what that you know that utilizing the data or well, how is that going to help the marmots how does that mean that there's more marmots at the end of the day so building in those links i think really helps and it, it also to be blunt it really helps staff that are spending a lot of time uh, working on a single species it's pretty easy to sometimes get uh, channeled into a specific way of thinking and to forget to sort of step back and keep asking yourself, well, okay, how, how is this work really going to change outcomes for the marmots? How's it, where are those connections and links? Um, the other recommendation that I have really comes down to that, this question of a plan versus a, a strategy. Um, one of the things that there's been a call for already is to renew some of the uh, the work that was done through this workshop um, to repeat some of it and, and that's it's a significant challenge simply to repeat a, a PBHA workshop it would be really nice to see some mechanisms and thinking in the plan about uh, how to how to really adapt so really embed that adaptive management approach right into that that thinking so you know once you've utilized the data you know what kinds of things are you going to be doing with it what are you going to be looking for uh, what kind of tests can you run to see if you're on track um, it would be great i mean i it would be wonderful if we could uh, end up with a model where you know we can take our field results on an annual basis put them into a model and get some kind of an output that was meaningful and could be communicated both to our staff and to our stakeholders and again, as I said before, um, and I suppose it's something that I tend to harp on a lot, but using impact-oriented goals and actions that really create those linkages between what it is you're recommending and how that's going to help the species. So that there isn't that kind of drift and sometimes an accidental um, move into areas that aren't really as beneficial whether we like it or not the reality is that for the marmot at least um, we're not necessarily engaged in science just for the sake of science you know we, we have a job we need to do with this species um, and certainly when we see elements like you know utilize data more fully Liz and I were talking about this on a, a re, after a recent conference call with a number of researchers who are trying to do research on Vancouver Island marmots and there's a range of research that is proposing to utilize the data that we've collected. And some of it is really important and it's gonna have deep implications for the way that we recover this species. And some of it will use the data, but ultimately we're not really waiting for those results. You know, it's, it's not really gonna make any difference to us um, regardless of what that research shows up or it's not likely to one of those has more value to us than, than the other does. And it's important to identify and prioritize uh, that type of thinking that might come well after your workshop. So, you know, we didn't know about any of this, this research, none of it had been proposed in 2015. So it, it's just to try and help keep people focused. I think there is, and I, you know, I think this speaks to the success of the workshop there is a real desire among team members and i use that word team in its broadest sense so recovery team our staff uh, to repeat this type of a workshop or something similar in the future um, and that i think is a you know liz talked about how 
reticent some of our staff were and some of the stakeholders were to engage in this workshop when it was first published. To see that, as I'm to repeat it already, I think is um, speaks to its success. Um, and other than that, I think everything else here is really uh, information that I've already repeated. There's, oh, the, the one, uh, sorry, the one thing I didn't capture was it would be really nice to have a piece pulled out of this plan that was intended to go to a non-technical audience. Um, again, people like funders who maybe don't have the same kind of background in uh, working with critically endangered species. Um, something that had a little bit more information than just you know one or two page summary, but also avoided some of the uh, technically heavy language that we see in some of the, the reports. Liz, did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, I don't. And uh, yeah, so that's good for me. So I think that was the end of the part where I was going to talk. Um, if there's questions, I, I'm going to say Liz is happy to answer them all. Is that right, Liz? <laughs> I see we have a couple already that I can probably speak to. Um, do you want me to start on those, Jamie? That would be great. Thank you. Okay, and it looks like Kathy um, is still on the line, and so I will ask her to help address. It looks like James had a text or texted, had chatted in that uh, asking about the barriers to addressing the data, um, the analytical chain challenges. And I'll mention it from my perspective, but Kathy uh, certainly has has dealt with this data and can can pro provide some some even deeper insight. I think there's a couple of issues when it comes to fully um, analyzing the data in ways that can help address our questions. Uh, one is that often the data we're dealing with was collected for another purpose. And so the data is collected for one reason, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we have this question. Let's see, there might be something in the data that we can get to help answer this question. And so sometimes it's looking, trying to use data retrospectively to answer a different question. Um, the other has to do with expertise, and unlike a lot of endangered uh, species, this species does not have, or until recently certainly has not had, um, an academic researcher for whom this has been a focal species, which can often bring in a lot of analytical expertise. Um, certainly there is a fair bit of expertise on the recovery team, however, the recovery team members are Basically, a lot of it is their volunteer time, and any sort of analysis is, if it can be done, even if the individual has the expertise, is kind of off the side of the desk. So, you know, as someone who is a population biologist, I can see some of the things that could be done. I have the expertise potentially to do some of these analyses. However, uh, I I'm at a position where I am a teaching is my main focus. I don't have a research program, and so my ability to sit down and devote time to that is limited. Um, so, Kathy, do you want to speak to this as well? Uh, those are all really good points, Liz, and uh, some of the other things that were mentioned earlier are, are true as well, that the data wasn't all in one place. It was collected by different people in different formats. So just collecting all that and compiling it was one challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, methodologies changed. And so we worked for weeks over piles of data, but just trying to get um, a projection of what was the, the census over time with different methodologies so we could validate the model uh, retrospectively. Uh, that was a, a, a huge challenge. And so I think it was as you said, collect it for a different purpose, collect it with different methodologies, changing over time, so you were comparing apples and oranges. And then the fact, too, that there was a lot of data on this population as it was declining, but if I remember correctly, very little uh, before the decline. And so then we'd have to go to something like um, yellow uh, belly marmot data to try to look at what we think this marmot would have been doing uh, when the population was growing. And so uh, having only good data during the decline and no data during the, the more healthy uh, growth periods was a challenge. And if, if I can just jump in there, because that continues to be a huge challenge with this species. There's really no data available from 
before the decline, uh, there just wasn't a lot of interest in the species. And so many of the questions that, that have been asked even today, um, we don't have effective ways of answering those without turning to another species. And obviously that has limitations itself. Can we, I'm aware of where that where we are with time, and Christian's asked a question that's that's kind of is particularly suppose, relevant to the planning and links to policy and implementation around um, the involvement of government authorities with respect to the results of the workshops. And I suppose this sort of links to the extent to which it was kind of leverage, it was kind of recognised. You talked about credibility before, um, and I wonder if either of you could could speak to that. That's definitely Adam's area of expertise. So, Adam? <laughs> so, we have um, the provincial government here is particularly responsible for the Vancouver Island Marmot. Uh, and there's some involvement from at the federal government level as well. Our more regional municipal governments, because of the remote locations where the marmots live, they really haven't been involved at all. The, the government Provincial government, um, it's always, um, it, it has a, a lot of internal debates about its role with species. Uh, the reality is in British Columbia that the marmot is one of the very few species where there's any real provincial involvement, uh, meaningful provincial involvement at all. Um, so it, it's good that they're involved at some level, but they're not providing a ton of um, Certainly a, a policy support, for instance, um, British Columbia has a, a Wildlife Act, but it doesn't have an Endangered Species Act. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a mix there. This has been really important in terms of getting some of those provincial biologists that uh, maybe expressed some doubts about the feasibility of, of any recovery being effective for this species, um, getting them back on board. And it's certainly been important for communicating with uh, higher level individuals in government. Um, again, providing that external oversight and that external involvement of uh, recovery experts to, to demonstrate that, you know, we are um, engaging in an effective program. Uh, and can so I just actually answer the question? Uh, I, I'm going to um, um, presume, presume so because I'm being greedy and just want to ask my question linked in with that. Um, and that is, do you think there's anything that you would suggest um, for future planning that might increase the extent to which implementation occurs? Because you did make the point that, that uh, you know, I'm sure that, you know, there are things that haven't happened that might have happened. Is it is it related to particular groups not being completely kind of bought in or committed to it? And is there anything you would suggest to overcome that within future planning processes? I think that, you know, we have fairly good participation from most of our stakeholders. And we are fortunate that most of our stakeholders uh, have biologists on staff. So whether we're talking about a government or um, Timber West and Island Timberlands, which are our timber companies, they have staff biologists who are able to participate in the workshop. Uh, so I think that it has been quite effective as a as a communications tool um, and as a way to, to get them involved. So I'm not sure that I have any more specific recommendations in that regard, other than um, they send their biologist, but their biologist is rarely a decision maker in the organization, unfortunately. So um, again, having some outreach to be able to communicate and to assist those biologists in communicating with uh, individuals that are in decision-making roles or resource allocation roles in those organizations, giving them tools to help them communicate uh, the results of a workshop like this, which are technical and probably not part of the core business of what uh, these organizations do. You know, their, their core business is uh, harvesting trees and their decision makers are well versed in the technical aspects of tree harvesting and the biology of tree harvesting. And so to go from 
we're going to talk about tree harvesting to well here's a species that lives in tree free meadows that we are kind of ignoring because there's not a lot of value there for us anyway uh, and let's talk about the recovery of that. Uh, that that can be a bit of a gap so a lot of it just comes down to that communications and language uh, and sort of striking a balance between real information and uh, and just how accessible that is to an audience that um, that didn't actually participate in the workshop firsthand. There's all, what you you are suggesting to me is or making me think about is that there's obviously stakeholder analysis that goes into determining who comes along to the workshop, but then you've got this next phase where you have this document that could go to multiple sources, and there may be people you know that they've got to go to. But there's almost an, a kind of a justification to another bit of analysis to say who might or who, who could this be helpful to or who might pick this up. And therefore, how do we kind of in a way add to this report to ensure that it's, it's communicated in a way that connects with them. Um, and obviously, it's, in, in our case, it's kind of helpful for the species. But thinking about where that report is going to go to next and as you uh, alluded to, the language that's used. Yeah. Um, so make it most valuable. So even when you think about you know what stakeholders are going to be involved, in many cases you're going to get an individual that represents an organization, and typically, well, certainly in our case, um, we ended up with individuals that have the strongest background from those organizations in uh, you know in biology and relevant experience. But again, those aren't always actually decision makers in those organizations. So as you say, um, when they go back to, and, and I don't mean to pick on Timber West here, but you know their, their name is kind of foremost on my list. Uh, so they, so when you know Dave Lindsay goes back to Timber West and says, this is what resulted, the people who actually make the decisions, Dave isn't one of the people who makes the decisions on how much money Timber West spends on marmots or uh, how they change um, the you know, harvest plans as a result of marmots. So giving him tools to communicate with those other stakeholders within his own organization um, would be, yeah, would certainly I think have a lot of value. Thanks very much. I'm aware of where we are now. We did start at about five past, so we'll stop at five past as well. Um, uh, uh, Kathy, uh, I just wondered, just because we talked, uh, um, Liz and Adam have talked about the value of the the quantitative assessment and kind of that, that again, that um, uh, people kind of wanting to sort of believe in the numbers. It kind of means has more, has meaning, and and thinking about multi species planning, linking with use of PVA and appropriateness or not and I wondered if you could talk about you know the, the use of PVA when you uh, when we are talking about more than one species uh, right just briefly it's challenging because PVA is time-consuming and and data hungry um, I would say if you're talking about a couple of species that are very much linked to each other uh, for instance say a black-footed ferret and, and prairie dogs would be one example you can build PVAs that are linked together where the species actually influence each other depending on what's happening with those numbers, but that's very data intensive. Um, you could also have independent models if you were interested in species in an area and certain impacts, uh, whether they're human or whether they're habitat influenced, um, might have different effects on different species. You could build models that, that would link in that way. Um, but if you're talking a lot of species together, it's probably not practical to do a PVA component for each one. Um, an exception of what I've explored with that is if you were doing um, something that are very similar uh, species, maybe a, a bunch of small rodents or, or, or small cats, or I, I just did something with parrots, where they're very similar biology, the same genus, very similar threats, uh, you might be able to build one model and then tweak it just a little bit to meet the threats and the biology of each species. So there are some options out there, but in general, I think it's a challenge. Thank you very much, Kathy. And just to finish off, um, Adam and Liz, Philippe was asking a question. I'm not sure whether I'm phrasing it correctly, but um, the extent to which you feel that the program has reached its goal. Uh, and you know, ultimately, you, you mentioned this before, Adam, about kind of in a way the development of quantitative goals. That it's not so much the fact that there's a problem with quantitative goals, but if they're not 
kind of relevant to the system that you're dealing with, if they're not actually the most important things to be aiming for. Uh, and in this case, I suppose it's, you know, that ultimate goal is restoration of the species. Kind of where, where, are you, where do you feel you're at just now? We have a long way to go. Uh, the species is by no means stable or self-sustaining in the wild at this stage. Um, so we have not achieved that fundamental goal. If our mission is to have a sustainable uh, wild marmot population, or one that requires only minimal and occasional intervention, such as maybe occasionally moving individuals from one metapopulation to the other, um, we're, we're nowhere near that. So we have a significant amount of work remaining in front of us before, um, before we can, I think, call our mission complete. Uh, so, so yeah, it, we're certainly not, um, we're not done yet. I suppose one silver lining to that is that you've got a job for a while, Adam, anyway. Um, so, <laughs> Adam, we, we have a plan. There's no shortage of endangered species, I'm afraid. <laughs> Adam and Liz and everybody else, thank you so much for joining us, staying on a bit extra. And um, um, just to flag up that the next one will be um, on the, now my, uh, Excel has closed down, but if you're interested, email me. It's in February, um, and it's going to be with Kathy looking at the um, IUC and ex situ guidelines and its um, its application in in a range of contexts using a number of different case studies. Um, so we'll be sending out a, a, um, a, an invite to that. If you want to join us, please do. And uh, yeah, Adam and Liz, thank you so much for joining us, and goodbye to everyone. Thanks for the Thank invitation. You.